Welcome to New Perspectives on RVN TV. I'm your host, Barry Lefkowitz, and as you know, I come to you each week with issues and topics uh, in the news. Uh, New Perspectives is designed to help give you a perspective and hopefully educate and inform you on a particular topic or issue. Uh, today, we're in the midst of presidential election, and at the same time, there are many races that are going on below at the national, state, and local levels. You know, many people have turned from being classified as either a Democrat or Republican and have become independents. However, there is a growing trend to the development of third-party groups uh, who no longer believe that the two-party system uh, works today. We see that at the federal level, you know, for example, uh, with the fact the inability for Congress to be able to get reasonable gun control in spite of everything that's happening across the country, laws that do not violate traditional Second Amendment rights. You know, my guest today, uh, and we're really pleased we're shooting him directly from, uh, from Illinois, is Amar Patel, who is chairman of the American Solidarity Party, and he's coming from outside of Chicago. Um, and Amar, first of all, grew up in suburban Chicago and earned his BA at the University of Illinois uh, in chemistry, math, and psychology, which is a kind of strange mix. Uh, his MA is in education, uh, and he and I were sharing the fact that we have similar uh, backgrounds in that vein. Um, he's a high school teacher uh, since 1998 at a high school called Conant, and I hope I pronounced it correctly this time, um, in statistics, calculus, and computer programming, and his wife also uh, is a teacher. Uh, Amar, welcome. Uh, we're really pleased to have you with us today. Um, I, I'm curious, what interested you originally in politics? Well, you know, Barry, like a lot of people, I, I didn't really have much interest in politics when I was in high school. Uh, kind of did the high school thing. I was in sports, hung out with friends. I was pretty much in the uh, late 80s where video games were very popular. So I was kind of the typical high school kid. When I went to college, uh, I kind of, I, I wouldn't say fell in with uh, a certain crowd, but I, I got to know some people that were very active in their faith and uh, were particularly pro-life. And so my first election, when I turned 18, was the Clinton-Bush election. And uh, you know, to be honest, I was pretty much at that point in time, having not had a lot of political experience, and kind of a one-issue voter. And now so, that was 1992, uh, right? I'm sorry? That was 1992? 1992, yes, okay. 1992, right. So in that election, uh, you know, I voted for Bush, uh, uh, President Clinton, and after he got elected, I mean, he was, he was uh, definitely a pro-choice candidate. And so, uh, you know, it was a disappointing time, but I think even through that election process, uh, I got more involved in the pro-life movement. And uh, throughout college, just became learning more, I uh, learned more and more about politics, uh, history, European history, world history, uh, you know, Christian history, Islamic history, lots of other religions, and started to form uh, my worldview over a period of time. Uh, but. I got married when I was 23, which nowadays is very, very young. Correct. And, uh, yes. You know, we had we had kids, uh, you know, when we were 28, and so there was that kind of uh, point in time where I went into a cocoon. So I was still learning. You know, I was reading, 
uh, you know, kind of watching a lot of you know CNN, Fox News, C-SPAN, whatever I could get my hands on as news. But with two little children, it just wasn't something that I was really, really active in. Just maybe a side passion or a hobby that I was I was going with. But you were um, still pro-life at the time, correct? I'm sorry? But you still philosophically were pro-life, am oh, I correct? Absolutely, okay. yeah, I would say I was definitely pro-life. Uh, and, I, and I think I was getting more involved in my own Catholic faith, and so starting to see different aspects of other issues in that lens uh, really kind of started molding my, my uh, political experience. And when we got to the election of 2016, I think what really uh, got to me was no, neither candidate, neither of the major party candidates was anywhere close to what I would find acceptable. And, and I couldn't bring myself to vote for the lesser of two evils. And I think a lot of people really started to feel that kind of that pain of, of I can't split my values uh, in half and then have to choose one of those two halves. Okay. So uh, I, you know, I, I kind of was an orphan, basically, politically. Uh, I ended up voting for myself as a, as a joke so I could go home and tell my kids uh, who were just old enough where they kind of knew you know, about politics. They talked about it at school. They probably had a mock election. And they're like, Daddy, who'd you vote for? And I said, guys, I voted for myself. And I know I have at least one vote. So, you know, you can be proud of me. Um, you, did it, uh, you, did a, a, uh, you did it as what we would refer uh, to as a write-in, correct? Correct. I okay. wrote it in. I'm sure it wasn't even counted, you know, but at least in my mind, you know, it was there. Technically, um, it has to be, by the word. Afterward, I, uh, I found the American Solidarity Party. I just was, I mean, I was at that point very engaged politically, uh, I think just because of the, the frustration, you know, that we all felt, or many of us felt, about, you know, what was going on in the country. And so when I came across the, the uh, platform of the American Solidarity Party, I was, I was, my heart was, you know, thumping in my chest. Like, this is, this is me. You know, I, I found my home. Uh, and so I got involved. Uh, you know, a little bit later, within a year, I was elected to the National Committee. Last year, I spent uh, a year on the National Committee as the Vice Chair, and then in June this year, I was elected Chair. Now, were, uh, if I recall, you actually went through some special training. I'm sorry? As I recall, you went through some special training to oh. help you in terms of with this third-party movement. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, like a lot of, of uh, you know, meetings, a lot of discussions, uh, you know, online reading. I mean, there was, you know, nothing really special in terms of, like, I guess, training, but I think a lot of time spent for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people, my friends would say, and you know, when I'd be on, involved online, they see a lot of my discussions and, and uh, you know, the things I would be getting into. And they'd say, you know, why do you waste your time with that? You know, what's going to happen is what's going to happen. And... You know, you can't really change the system. And I, and I said, I can't live with that. You know, at the end of the day, if, uh, if that's all we're going to be is just living with the system and accepting, you know, the, the bad choices that are available to us, uh, you know, what are we saying to our children, our children's children about our world? You know, are we going to accept, you know, the world that is made for us or are we going to try to change it? And that was when, uh, you know, I really, really got involved. Um let, let's go back for a second. Um, what's your perception of what is the problem with a two-party system? Yeah, so we've discussed this a lot, obviously, as a third party, uh, and, and really engaging with other people. The uh, two-party system, when, when you have a first-past-the-post election uh, voting system, where the person with the most votes automatically wins, and then you break that up into districts where uh, lots and lots of districts are voted the same way. Uh, you really have to, you know, have a two-party system because, you know, the the uh, individuals in different smaller groups have to coalesce and roll into one of two groups in order to capture any seats, any victories in any kind of election. And so when that happens, people start to kind of give up their core passions and their, their innate, deeply held beliefs in one thing, and then it'll be another thing, and then slowly, all of a sudden, you've given up half of your belief system. And, and that's, you know, as a, uh, 
as a third party, but you know, as a third party that's rooted in what we would call Christian democracy, you know, we really feel strongly that the the deeply held religious beliefs of not just Christians but Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, you know, uh, Jews. I mean, there, there's core beliefs that don't actually have to do necessarily with our particular faith, but those beliefs are pretty consistent. And the two parties have taken many of those, you know, deeply held beliefs and split them into two halves. You know, Why don't we stop there for a second? Uh, we sure. have to do what they call uh, make a break for a commercial. Okay. Uh, so listen, please stay with us. Uh, and uh, we will come back and let uh, Mark uh, continue discussing with us uh, about his perception in regards to the issues with the two-party system. And then uh, I want you to share with the audience about your recent uh, adventure in Wisconsin at the fair. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Add us on social media to watch bloopers, behind the scenes footage, previews, and more. I work 13 hours a day, six days a week. So when I'm off the clock, I gotta get stuff done. So when I need a snack, I need something healthy, tasty, and easy to eat like wonderful pistachios without the shells. They're protein powered, delicious, and great on the go. And that's perfect for me. Thanks, Liz. A woman without a lot of time. Whether you're a gourmet cook or just want to eat like one, visit Rostelli Market Fresh, your home for the freshest locally sourced ingredients to please everyone who loves great food. Our organic meats, quality seafood, and free-range poultry are cut fresh to order. Chefs create culinary-inspired prep foods made fresh every day, which pair nicely with our vast selection of fine wines and spirits. Choose from handmade pastas, artisan cheeses, organic produce, and grocery items, all from the finest purveyors. Rostelli Market Fresh, from our family to yours. RVN TV is a platform for people of any industry to share their story. Over 285,000 viewers are tuning in to RVN TV shows monthly. We guarantee a great experience that you'll be sharing. To new perspectives on RVN TV, uh, I'm your host, Barry Lefkowitz. I come to you each week with uh, major issues and topics in the news. And as you know, uh, if you were with us the first half, we're talking about the two-party system, but the fact that there may very clearly be a need for third party to allow the opportunity for people to raise their voice and to be able to share their ideas outside of the traditional two-party system. So, Amar uh, Patel, we thank you so much. Uh, we're bringing you live uh, from uh, Illinois. Uh, you're 20, 20 miles outside of uh, Chicago. Uh, I hope your weather is a little better than what we're experiencing. Uh, I had to take my jacket off because it is just really brutal. But uh, you were talking about, you know, the fact that a third party system was needed in order to be able to allow for the true sharing of ideas and people's feelings. If you could pick up from there. Yeah. So, you know, uh, what we were talking about, the idea of the, the first past the post vote, uh, as any third party, we are very much in favor of alternative voting systems that allow voters to actually vote for who they want and not just for who they think might win. You know, and it, it, we really feel it's important that people be able to follow their actual conscience and then that vote for their conscience actually becomes information for other candidates. So if, if uh, we were able to run a, in a ranked choice voting system, and we had an American Solidarity Party candidate, which we will have a presidential candidate in the 2020 election. Oh, great. Uh, and, and so, like, for example, in Maine, that has a ranked choice system. If someone 
really wanted to vote their conscience and they really believed in a whole life candidate, uh, they would vote for our candidate with no worry about being a spoiler in any way in the election, either one way or the other for the two major parties, or they could vote Green Party or Libertarian. Let, let, let me ask a question. You used the terminology ranked vote. Could you kindly explain to our viewing audience what you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is one of those things. Uh, we discussed education a little bit uh, before the show, and we were talking about what some people just don't know about. They, they didn't even know what our voting system, when I say first past the post to some people, they go, what's that? I said, well, that's just how we vote. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that had a name. So the ranked choice voting system allows people to take an entire ballot of, you know, a variety of candidates and then actually rank their candidates like first choice, second choice, third choice, for, uh, fourth choice, instead of just saying, this is who I want to vote for. Uh, and then what happens is the, ba the ballots are counted, and if no one has a majority, they eliminate the person with the lowest number of first place votes. And then whoever that person had voted for as their second place vote would then become their first place vote, which would then continue on until you had a majority of, of voters. And what that allows you to do is pick who you really, really like, and then pick who you like second, and so forth. And you can stop voting after you know two people if you don't like anyone else. Right. But it doesn't stop you from picking who you really like. And those results, when posted, would tell the other parties that, hey, there's a lot of people who like this person's policies. Maybe I should consider them and listen to the voters a little bit. I, I think you just laid the foundation for a key element of the purpose of a third party, and that is is that you're actually looking to help both develop policy and shift the way people think about things. Is, would that be a correct statement? Absolutely. I mean, as any third party, you know, if anyone's being honest as being a third party member, they would say not only are they trying to build their party base and get their word out there, possibly get their candidates elected, but they also want the conversation to change. You know, whatever their core values are, uh, they really do want the main parties to at least take on some of those core values. And ideally, there would be a shift in the political system, which right now the shift is just pulling apart at the seams, you know, the, the, the country into two radical directions. Um, you know, and as a as a third party, we would want to be part of that, you know, that shifting, but in a positive way. Um, now, you just recently, because uh, I know when we were talking uh, the other day, you just recently uh, were in Wisconsin at uh, one of their fairs, uh, and you had quite a story to share with me about uh, the experience you had, you had a booth there and so forth. If you could share that with the audience. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. So many, many people came by our, our booth, um, and the, uh, you know, the common response was, oh, I've never heard of you before. You know, and right. one of the things that, that as a new, fairly new party, you have to contend with is just lack of knowledge. And you think that, you know, if you get your word out there, but, you know, at a fairground, when people are just walking around, they're enjoying a hot dog, you know, a drink or whatever, and then they see a booth, they might stop and have a chat with you. But in someone's busy day, when they're after work and they just want to go home and watch a, a ball game or a TV show, uh, you don't get that opportunity. So several people did stop by, and uh, we had some good discussions, you know, with people uh, uh, that, that really kind of opened my eyes towards the hesitation towards third parties, also the the... Uh, you know, lack of information that the media provides or our, our educational system about how politics works in general. So, you know, we had some people say, aren't you afraid of, you know, blocking this person or taking a votes away from this person? And I said, you know, until we stop that mentality of you know, that, that the system is somehow, you know, uh, sacrosanct and we can't disturb it, uh, we're not going to really change things in the political system. So I think that was... That was kind of eye-opening for me that, that you had a lot of people that didn't know about us or were really hesitant to even consider third parties, and it was good discussions. Now, uh, you spoke to uh, some of the folks at the Wisconsin Fair. One of them, I think, was Planned Parenthood. 
and that was an eye-opening experience for you in terms of their general attitude when you talked with them. Yeah, it, so one of the people that I did come across, uh, you know, was like, oh, you know, well, we like, we're a whole life party, so we want not only, um, you know, pro-life issues with regards to abortion, but also, you know, we're looking for an improvement in health care, if not a movement towards universal health care, an increased social safety net for the poor, uh, you know, and, uh, working for refugees and, and towards a just immigration system. And so having this discussion uh, with this person, they said, well, we all like, we like all those things except the abortion thing, you know, and I was like, right, but I think the idea of a whole life perspective uh, and what, you know, in Christian democracy, we would say the concept of personalism, where human dignity is, you know, paramount in our in our entire thinking, where if we don't have policies that respect the human person across the board, then other policies start to suffer because we're giving up on some of that, our, our deeply held values that, that uh, every human being has innate dignity. Um, in terms of your third party, which is the uh, American Solidarity Party, uh, share with the audience, you know, for example, you mentioned immigration. Uh, I I'm curious because we here uh, on my show, we did a eight-part series on immigration just to help you know, educate our viewers and to get, be able to sort of open a window for them. What, what is your general feeling about uh, immigration as a party? Well, you know, I will say, first of all, personally, as a son of uh, two immigrants that came to this country shortly before I was born in the late 60s, and my mom came over actually a couple years later uh, after my dad had worked for a long time and lived basically in squalor uh, with some you know, public assistance. It, you know, for me, immigration hits home pretty strongly in the sense that, that that's the only reason I'm here, you know, as a first generation born in the United States citizen. And uh, so I've always had a hard time as a pro-life person. That's one of the issues in the Republican Party that I would always struggle with is that there was always kind of a negative attitude. And my dad said he, he always – we'd have discussions and he always voted Democrat because he's like a Republican – you know, in, in a very immigrant sort of way. He was like, well, Republicans hate uh, immigrants, so you have to vote that way. And I was like, well, I have I like other things, values also, Dad. But, you know, that's just kind of how, how uh, I think people think in general. But as a whole life party, we look at immigration, especially, you know uh, – the concept of immigration and naturalization and a path to citizenship and, and you know immigrants have built this country they continue to uh, do a great deal of work within the country uh, are there people that are undocumented of course right um, and there's a lot of injustices that have led to that situation so it isn't as simple to say send them back you know and let's deport everyone and let's start from scratch let them come legally you know, a lot of times we don't know people's stories, you know, and that idea of human dignity, it requires us to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters, regardless of who their parents are and where they've come from. Um, one of the things that I would say is, you know, we're a party that really, really believes in loving your neighbor as yourself. And then, uh, you know, in, in the in the Gospels, someone asks Jesus, you know, who is my neighbor? Well. In the Solidarity Party, we would say we are a worldwide community. Obviously, we're Americans first. We do believe in the rule of law, but at the same time, you know, there is an aspect of our neighbor isn't simply the person that lives next to you. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, in the introduction, uh, I mentioned the fact that Congress's inability uh, to deal with gun control. Uh, has your party taken a stance uh, on gun control, and why? Yeah, that's it's very interesting. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion in, on gun control, and one of the things that I think we all kind of agree on is uh, that the issue of gun control seems to come up when we have these mass shootings. Right. And uh, the shame of it is, you know, the mass shootings, are, which are a terrible thing, terrible thing, and we obviously, uh, as a party, that I, I don't think there's anyone that would 
deny that we decry that kind of that scale of violence and depravity. But at the same time, we feel it's an injustice to only speak about gun violence and the number of deaths that occur in the United States when these issues come up. And you see this in the media that you'll see, you know, first one party will make some kind of, you know, they'll tweet or have some kind of major media statement and the yeah. other one will come back and say, you're using the, this as a whatever. I mean, why not, why are we talking about the number of, uh, you know, deaths that are happening in the inner cities, you know, at a constant rate all the time, which is day after day, weekend after weekend. And I you know one of my city, my beloved city of Chicago, you know, uh, you might get a mention of it on Monday and say, oh, you know, we had, it's just like a passing thought. We had 50, you know, gun deaths in the city of Chicago last weekend. Oh, there were 30 gun deaths. And that's like not even a side story when as you have a gunman that, that uh, unfortunately kills, you know, a handful of people uh, in, a, in a crowded place, that all of a sudden becomes national news. So that's a gross injustice. And we also have talked a lot in the party about um, how many suicides occur. You know, and then the suicide rate amongst people, especially in rural areas, right, where where the economic system has abandoned the populace, that you have a lot of desperation and, uh, you know, a lot of lack of health care, basic health care, you know, psychological health care, psychiatric treatment. And so, you know, where, yes, obviously, we all are saddened by, by uh, mass shootings. We feel that gun violence is best addressed. You know, many of us feel gun violence is best addressed in in uh, helping out, you know, attacking the problem, the deeper problem, the big problem, through economic justice, especially in the inner cities and in rural areas where we have these major, major discrepancies in gun deaths and gun violence. So, uh, you know, the issue of gun control, like the actual guns themselves, very, very, very uh, strong issue that we do discuss. I haven't come up with an official policy on exactly that, but we actually feel probably that it's more pertinent to be talking about the underlying issue and not the the uh, symptom that really is what we always, not we being, but media and society really gets right. drawn into the symptom. Listen, uh, unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time, uh, but we will have to have you come back uh, another time because this has been really enjoyable. Uh, I want to thank our audience for allowing me to come into your homes uh, each and every week. And I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, Amar Patel uh, for helping give us a new perspective about third party because more often than not, we're not exposed to that uh, because we've been, uh, the media doesn't really give third party uh, much coverage unless it's someone who's really unique, um, like Ross Perot or something of that nature. So we will see you again, uh, and thank you once again, and we look forward to being in your home next week. Thank you, and take care, and Amar, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it.